My life before I left Nigeria wasn't really, I'd say, a fun one, considering I was born into an average family. Uh, I didn't grow up having everything I, I wanted, but God will have it, I had everything I needed as a child. Year after year, thousands of Nigerians migrate to different countries around the world for the pursuit of better opportunities and standards of living. This almost comes as no surprise when the country's outrageously high standard of living, as well as the fast increasing rate of poverty and insecurity, are pushed into the spotlight. Born and raised in Edo State alongside her five siblings, 27 year old Gift Priye Solomon had to make do with the financial struggles her parents faced in a bid to provide the best life for their children. My name is Gift Priya Solomon, aka GPS. I know, right? GPS. So, uh, I'm an entrepreneur, a uh, travel consultant, UAE's first female delivery rider, and recently uh, I became one of the 75 faces of the UAE. I was, I was born by an um, hard working woman. Now I feel passionate talking about her because she's gone. She's hard working and she's always been there for us, considering uh, things were not perfect, but then she always made sure that we had everything we, we needed growing up. It all started a couple of years ago because I didn't have everything. I didn't have the luxury as a child. Uh, I wasn't born with a silver spoon. I was practically the spoon we carved it. Literally, like, we literally carved the spoon we were raised with. In 2016, Gift joined the long list of Nigerians who have migrated in search of greener pastures. However, like many Nigerians who relocate with similar hopes and dreams, Gift was met with several unexpected and greatly troubling twists and turns. I decided to leave Nigeria, I think that was about seven years ago, it's been about seven years now that I left Nigeria and that was because, I mean, the people that raised me, they literally like worked their ass off just to make sure I and my siblings have the best we could, that they could actually afford. It got to a point where I felt like things wasn't really going where it was almost going from worse to worse, if there's a word like that. So I just decided like, what should I do? Should I keep waiting on? Because before I left Nigeria, I've never done anything before, never worked. I was literally surviving on my parents like whatever they bring to the table so when things wasn't going well i just felt like okay it's time to actually give back help the people that has been helping me all my life so i decided to leave nigeria convincing them that i want to travel because they know we don't have a family there i've never been like, i don't even, i didn't have even have a passport i've never been out of the country before i don't have relatives anywhere other than nigeria it was an asshole i had to lie to my parents Forgive me now, Dad. <laughs> I had to lie to my parents that I got a job already waiting for me when I knew there was nothing because I needed to be really convinced and considering they want to know what are you going to do there. And back then, Dubai, Dubai. Now Dubai has softened, I feel. Before, when everybody hear Dubai, there's a tag to it. When lady travels to Dubai, they're like, I quote them, prostitution. That's what ladies go there to do. So it was really hard for me to convince my siblings, my mother and my father. But of course, we all know I was able to co convince my mom and she was able to help talk to my dad. Eventually, they allowed me to travel. In this case, I didn't prepare a lot considering I told them I got the job already. Mommy, don't worry. Rent is already sorted. Everything is sorted. I'm just going to Dubai and I'll start working and start. I already gave them that assurance and the reason to let me travel. Before I left, I felt like I've already told my parents the job is ready. Why don't I work with someone? Like you just make sure this is happening. So I got in touch with an agent from a friend. And <laughs> the agent told me, okay, uh, we're going to get you this job. Everything's going to be sorted. This was after I already convinced my parents that that was a lie in the first place. So, and then the idea came, okay, why don't you get something or some help that can actually help you get something. So I got in touch and long story short, we got talking. They told me how much I needed to pay. I said, okay, I still remember there's a friend of me, a friend of mine back then, Chantel, a sister works with my, one of the microfinance bank. The last one year I got was after collecting money from friends and a couple of good friends that I had back then. They, and she told me, okay, my sister works in a bank, you can get a loan or something. I've never had a loan before. And I felt skeptical about asking my parents to ask you, okay, you sure you don't get a job? You already have a job, why are you? So I went to Ash, helped me. 
and then we got something. So I paid everything off, I went. So this time when I was traveling, I, really, I only had $300 with me when I got there. And this $300 was borrowed because they said I needed to have BTA. Apparently, you need to have cash when you're leaving the country to show in the airport. So when I got to the airport, of course, I showed them I had somewhere to stay. Everything was going well. So Dubai, I'm traveling to Dubai. I kept on telling friends, I'm going to Dubai, I'm going to Dubai. So on this great day, I went to, I got to Dubai. I called the person that was supposed to meet me up. I was expecting them to pick me up. I called, I am in Dubai now, where are you? Okay, you have to go outside and get a taxi. Okay. I, I for one, I was frightened considering it's a, it's a new land. Like everything was different, seeing people that you cannot really conversate with. Now, thanks to God, my English is better. I think people can understand me now. Then it was horrible. My English wasn't really good. My pronunciations were bad. I think it's still bad, but then it's getting better, by the way. So then communicating with them, like bringing my English down to their level, a level they could understand. And maybe most times when I want to pronounce something, I probably pronounce it the wrong way instead of this way that they understand. It was really hard to communicate. But eventually I got a taxi, only for me to find out that I was going to another state. It's called Sharjah, not Dubai. They told me, okay, you're going to Sharjah. I said, okay. So I got on the taxi, we were going, we were going so far. And Dubai, all the taxis are metered, right? We're going too far, like, we're going, we're going. I was like, where are we going? We got to a stage where I wasn't seeing, seeing the high rise building, like the Dubai that I see on pictures. I got to a stage where I was seeing like small, small buildings. I was like, where are we? So I got there, the lady told me, she was a lady, and then she's like, this is where you're going. I said, okay, how much? It was almost half the money I came to Dubai to start a life with. The cab fare, and I was like, so I had to pay. Then again, I thought, okay, there's a job, just pay. So I paid my cab. I called the guys, like, okay, you have to cross to the other side. I crossed, I took another taxi because apparently there were borders. So if I travel, there's gonna be like a transiting fee, more like the toll gate, but then there's a lot. So he told me, stop at the border and then walk past and take another taxi so you don't pay for the border fee. So I did that. Upon her arrival in Dubai, Git discovered that she had been a victim of a 450,000 Naira scam by a Nigerian employment agent. I got there and I got the shock of my life. Trust me, when I said I was struggling in Nigeria, accommodation was like, okay, I still had a room and my sister was sharing. When I got there, it was a villa, one bedroom villa. And then I saw beds on the floor. Okay, I was like, <laughs> where, where is this? I didn't say anything, of course. I just kept quiet and I'm like, hi. They received me and I got inside. First of all, the settings I was seeing, like for a Dubai standard kind of way, wasn't what I was expecting. So I just, I entered, I was smiling, okay, I'm in Dubai. I still didn't know the difference. Now I can explain it, so I can say, okay, this, that was a different state. This is Dubai. But then I didn't know, I thought, okay, different area in Dubai. So when I got there, they made soup. Oh uh, yeah, okra soup, I still remember. Okra soup with mushrooms and then pandu. So they gave me, I was like, okay. Then I was, I can still remember walking, I was still tiptoeing, considering like some of the villas, there are like those kind of walls, stuffs on it, like walls that are filled from water. And I was like, ah, okay. And I easily get irritated. I was already irritated. I just felt, it's fine. Let me just, this is Dubai, you're in Dubai. The only, only consolation I had back then was you're in Dubai, you're in Dubai. So after some time, I I got used to it. I started staying. Two days after the guy told me, you need to pay money for rent. I was like, ah, oh, ow. Oh, I thought it was already sorted out. He said, no, the agent said, you're gonna give me money, a thousand dirhams. I didn't even have up to a thousand dirhams because considering I came with $300, I had already spent almost half the money to pay for cab traveling. He said, you need to give me, and I, I don't have money. Eventually said, no, 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 this is Dubai, and started making calls, and I was like, okay. So I called Nigeria again to borrow. And meanwhile, the $300 I came with, I was supposed to turn it back and send it back to Nigeria to return the person I took it from. This time I couldn't, because I didn't even have it. So I had to look for money, pay the rent, start living. From where I was staying in Sharjah to Dubai was like over an hour, if you're traveling by, by bus, to over an hour to get there. So most times when I have, I got to her and I was like, okay, waiting for two days. I was still chilling, like, okay, go out, take pictures. So sometimes I was like, okay, how far? When are we getting, when am I starting work? And they're like, oh, sorry, you didn't come on time. 
the job you had was already taken. We're waiting for you. Your visa came late. The story started coming up, and then there was no job. And later they said, okay, you need to start doing like going for classes to get a security job. I was like, how? I was terrified. I said, no, it's not like that. You can probably be working in banks or malls, ladies just standing. And I was like, okay. Now this time I was like, I was ready to do anything. After some time, the job wasn't coming. You go for a job for, there are going to be two openings. And the numbers of people that goes there, I'm not even exaggerating. You get more than 100 people, 300 people searching for two jobs. There are only two openings. So everyone will be there. Before it gets to your time, most times I wasn't fort I wasn't lucky enough. Before it gets to my time, they say, sorry, sorry, everyone go send your CV online. And I've already traveled like one hour journey, if not more sometimes, to my interview places. So this went on for months, more than three months. It was getting to my final month because I had three months visa. The visa was almost expiring, and at this point, I was like, gift, you're fucked. Because I didn't know about visa change inside the country. I knew I had to leave the country. I, the last thing I wanted to do was stay in legally. So after three months, I was like, now I need to get something, anything. At this point, I started looking for any job. Cleaning job, I was applying for cleaning job. Sometimes I go there, I dress up, and they'll be like, they, they receive me nicely when I get in and they tell them I'm applying for a job. They say, no, no, no. Immediately they just give me that, no, 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 not available. Because they just feel like you were probably overdressed for a cleaner position. So with time, my friends would tell me, hey, gift, you have to always wear jeans. Just be casual when you go to places like that. Because I said, okay, I started warming up. This kept on going. And three months passed, I didn't get something. I didn't get a job. After struggling for three months to make ends meet in Dubai, her visa expired and she returned to Nigeria with an even stronger conviction to find her way back abroad. I was like, what am I going to do? So I came to Nigeria. And at this point, my mom and my parents, they would call me every time. Mommy, can I call you back at my work? I kept lying like that. I kept saying those stuff like, let me call you back, mom, I'm at work. Uh, okay, work was fine today. I kept lying because I, this time I can't go back. I know there's no going back because if I tell them I don't have a job, they'll tell me to come back home. They're that disciplined. So I was, I kept on the lies. So three months after the visa expired, I, ca I came back. As God would have it, I had, I had a return ticket back to Nigeria. So when I got back, this time I was in Lagos. I couldn't go back to my, uh, my home, which is in Benin because what are you doing? You just left three months ago and you're working. So no money to go back. I needed to get a new visa and a new ticket to come back to Dubai. One thing kept on kept me going. I just felt I've already sacrificed a lot. I sold everything I had. My parents, they did a lot. So this was like, there is no going home. So that point, a friend of mine, Joy, she told me about MMM. And she's like, a gift, there's one thing now, you just pay 30,000, I'll give you 10%. I was like, really? So she started. So for about two, three weeks, I was in Lagos. I don't call my parents, I, only, I always call them on WhatsApp, so they wouldn't even know if I'm in town or not. After three weeks, I got cash. I was begging money. This time, I was willing to borrow money. So I was borrowing money from people just to invest in MMM. So that time, I was lucky. Uh, I got enough to help me through and I paid my visa, I got a ticket and I went back. Her eventual return to Dubai was just as unfavorable as her initial stay as she continued to struggle to find her footing. I kept, up, I kept on searching but this time I already had in mind gifts, there are no good jobs, anything you see just take. I was going, I was like, okay, I need to do this, I need to apply. I was applying for cleaning job, waitress whatever like anything because i just needed to get my stay the three months i was always looking for secretary jobs most times when i go there they turn me down but now i'm like this is reality i was applying for cleaning jobs outside i was in another state i was going to states that are worse than where i was to look for cleaning jobs to my greatest surprise they would, who doesn't give someone a cleaning position what like i mean what are you interviewing me for after the interview, they'll say, sorry, we're going to call you. I don't get calls back. That kept on going. At this point, I was doing five months already. The new visa was already two months gone. After five months of being stranded without a job in Dubai, Gift finally hit gold when she got a job as a phone operator in a restaurant. So I made a friend where I went for a cleaning, a cleaning job. I eventually got it, the job. 
I walked there for like two days. They told me, sorry, you did not pass because apparently I needed to do trials. I was like, am I not clean well? But then it's like sun, like me, considering me living in Nigeria, I had friends. There was one time I met a friend of mine. She, I was cleaning the windows like on the, on the balcony, but then it's like the waterfront. I was cleaning and saw a friend of mine I quickly ran inside because I didn't want that to see me. There are people that knows me from Nigeria and they don't want to, like, I can't tell people that I'm doing a cleaning job. So after two days, they told me, I'm sorry, um, you, you didn't get the job. I left and then I met a friend. She was a waitress, her name is Petite. Uh, she's like, okay, gift. So every now and then I would always come to the marina, which is where she walks in Dubai. Uh, she would take pictures of me, give me food. Uh, she would tell me, don't worry. And then she showed me where to buy stuff. Back then, Indomie was my favorite. At this time, things were was already going south in the apartment because I couldn't keep up. So I had to leave uh, the place where I was before. And I got another place where eight in the room, like in the room, eight bunk beds, two beds. I couldn't even afford the down bed. I, I could only get uh, the up bunk where like eight. So four beds, two, two people. Eventually, I started staying there. I was there. I was still dressed up, come out, so I wouldn't tell people. I had to do video calls with people because I just feel like I'm at work. I didn't want them to know how I was living. So when I met this girl, she started calling me out every now and then. She would tell me, okay, babe, come. She cooks and she gives me food. It was really hard. Sometimes I, I would have interviews. I can't go out because I don't have transport or food money like this. So on this blessed day, she called me, babe, come. Uh, I just got a restaurant downstairs. They're giving us discount, 30%, come. I said, okay. So I came to our place, because they sell food. After then, and then she's like, yeah, these people are looking for, do you want to probably apply? I said, yes, please. The HRO, they always do meet in our restaurant. So I said, okay. So I gave her my CV. And then they told me, okay, just wait. The HRO people, the same day they told me to wait. They called me and there were three, they interviewed me and they asked me, this was after five months. Of searching for a job they asked me of course my cv i lied i did this i worked here i worked here i worked here because my five months of job on team taught me that most times they had to give people without experience jobs and dubai didn't really care about your education or anything they just care about the, the experience you have so when i got there they like okay uh you want to go in for trial i said yes I got in, I pulled off my clothes because that day I was dressed for pictures. I went in and then they told me around here, like, okay, have you worked in a restaurant before? I said, yes. So I got the job. They told me, okay, you're hired, come. That day I was happy because this job is like a like elite job because I got a job as a phone operator, pretty much answering the phone. But this is different uh, considering it's a restaurant, so you have to like really help in the kitchen, do other stuff for your sole, job, your sole uh, responsibilities, making sure you take orders on the phone, answering customer complaints. I was thinking my life is solved, uh, like I'm good now. However, the job didn't come without its difficulties. So I got the job, I kept on working for some time. I was having major issues with people because the area where we're working is like on the marina, like on the island, like a place where the elite people that order, they are like, rich people so most of them are westerners they would call me can i get they'll tell me can i get mushrooms on my pizza i interpret something else i call it mushrooms most times when i read out like stuff to them they don't understand i, I can always remember going home crying like sometimes there was a customer that told me can i speak to someone that speaks english please so it got to the part where i was like frustrated everyone that i was working with no nigerian just one guy and the guy hardly talks so i was just like on my zone i've never worked in my life before never so walking this was like and the first time I, they gave me my uniform i remember going to the washroom i still have that picture and i took a picture of that i said to my brother mommy i'm at work that this is me now so i started having proof to actually tell them that okay i am working so after the struggle after some time I remember as if I, I would always record myself. I would talk and I would talk back as myself, record myself, keep listening just to make sure I get better. Watch um, YouTube videos of having an accent. Different, like I was just learning. I just wanted to be able to like communicate with customers because I knew I was having a lot of issues then, trust me. I was having a lot of issues. And then I'm like, don't worry, it's gonna be better. So I made a friend that actually helped me. She started helping me build my self-confidence. I started getting better. 
She eventually clawed her way to the assistant manager position and somehow pushed herself enough to also become UAE's first female food delivery person. So after two years, I got promoted to a store trainer on the same job. So this time, I was the one training new people. <laughs> so things started getting better. After a year, I got promoted into a supervisor. And on this fateful day, we were asked, uh, we always have this every now and then, like having a town hall meeting where all the employee comes together like a feast or something. So when we had that, our CEO was talking, I was like, okay, we're growing. We are not like, uh, we're not being, uh, uh, we're not concerned about the gender. So if there is anyone, any lady that wants to be uh, a female delivery rider, we are happy to help. I was just there, I was listening because our company is like, 80% on deliveries because I, work, I worked for a pizza place, like a pizza place. I was working then as a, a supervisor for a pizza place. And then every time we always have drivers that goes, how do they come? I always see the excitement. Like, hi sister, I got tips today. Hi sister, this customer gave me this. So it was always like, most of them, even when they go out, I always see the joy because like, I, I work directly with them. I am the one that packed the order, make sure they go out safely. So having that close interaction. So when he asked the question, I just raised my hand. This was a meeting of over 200 people. I just raised my hands like, I would do it. I've never rode a bike before. I didn't even have a license, nothing. I said, really? Everyone was looking at me. And then I was, at this point, I became the Nigerian that everyone didn't like because I was trying to be like, okay, this is me. Everyone, everywhere you go, gift. A customer will call, can I speak to gift? So it kept on going like that, like people like, What's she for me like? So eventually, when I raised my hand, whatever, like, and that's like a drama. How she get the bike license? So he told me, okay, are you ready to do it? I said yes. And then I eventually got the NOC, like non-objective certificate. So in Dubai, there's a thing where everything you have to have a license for driving a bike. I cannot even go on the road, even on the side line, without a license. So first things first, I had to get my license. So and getting a license outrageously expensive in naira now i think it's about almost a million naira to get a license yeah a car license i know <laughs> a car license and a bike license like i mean each almost a million like six thousand seven thousand dirhams thereabouts so of course the company gave me the money <laughs> yeah so they gave me the cash and they told me okay go and sign up i did that when I got to the school, they asked me, uh, are you aware that we don't have female bike instructors? Because, of course, no, no lady has ever come to say uh, they want to get a, a license. So I said, yeah. So I had to sign a waiver that it's fine for a male instructor to actually teach me how to ride. I can still remember going, when I go for classes, people like, okay, uh, you're driving car. I said, no, bike. So I kept getting that face, like, why would you want to... I didn't say I was even going to, into deliveries or anything. I just started like learning. It took me six months to actually get a license. You know, <laughs> it took me six months because there were a series of tests, road tests, theory and practical, everything. So after six months, I eventually got my license and officially started deliveries. Gift Hope's story pushes women from around the world to damn gender stereotypes, take on daring opportunities, and take their destinies into their own hands. Initially, I get mixed feelings, right? Initially, I was excited. Okay, I'm the first. Uh, if I set my mind at anything, I can actually do it. So that was like, okay, I shouldn't limit myself because of the gender, my gender, right? But for me right now, I just want to see ladies like coming up. You, you might not, you don't even need to be a female delivery rider. There are a lot of jobs, a lot of jobs that I feel like ladies can do because there are no job tags attached to some kind of jobs. So being the first female delivery rider feels awesome. I feel like I want to see more ladies because there are no gender tags to jobs. I don't know why we feel like, okay, I want to do this. They feel like, no, this is a male job. Uh, so being one of the 75 faces of the UAE uh, actually makes me feel like I achieved, I have achieved a lot considering where I came from, how I started being a Nigerian and being one of the 75 faces in the UAE. I feel like that's something that I'm very proud of. I am very proud of it. 
It wasn't easy. It took me years to get there. So what I have to say to ladies that are experiencing the limitations in their various field is keep pushing. There's a chapter in everyone's life that we don't read out loud. The struggles is always going to be there. Even when you're up here, you're down here, there's always a foundation. So just keep going. You might not be a f the first female delivery rider. You might not be, but you might be the best in what you're doing. So just keep going. I feel like uh, the world is currently getting better, where there are rooms that are being opened for ladies. Why don't we get in if the doors are already open?